can I, can I get the volume up for the video? We we'll return to in the TED Med section. Here, um, I just want to share with our our um, audience here a clip uh, from you on on Charlie Rose, who was probably mid career by this point in 1999. We only work at Walker Digital on inventions that we can patent. We don't work on things that you can't patent. If you look on the internet today. There are no patented business methods other than ours to speak of. So there's none of them we look out there and say, boy, we could have invented that. Amazon is a great company, Yahoo, eBay are all great companies, but none of them own their own business method. What makes our business different is literally over 20 right. patents. So it's interesting to me that, you know, at this point, you talk about the differentiation of business, uh, uh, of, of different businesses, and you talk about patents as a core part of your strategy. Looking back on this comment now, Amazon has uh, increased its value. Just as an example, Amazon has increased its value sevenfold. Yahoo's had a pretty rough go of it. Why do you think they, that in the case of Amazon, they've done so well? Amazon has executed phenomenally, and Walmart basically you know, put their head in the sand and never got out. So, and opened the door. Walmart was the incumbent. Yeah, I mean, Walmart, all the major retailers in the United States basically had to collectively behave uh, the way they did in order to allow Jeff and a great team of execution people to out-execute them all. So literally, that's what happened. And at, at the time when you were making these comments, you would have said that's a high-risk proposition for Jeff. Well, it was a high-risk proposition for Jeff, um, and it remains a high-risk proposition. Jeff, we're talking about, by the way, Jeff Bezos. Yes, it remains a high-risk proposition for Amazon. Uh, but Jeff is such a phenomenal business leader that he has diversified Amazon you know, beautifully. And if you look at their invention of cloud-based services and you look at Amazon's uh, you know, numerous experiments across the e-reader marketplace and other areas, you see that Jeff runs it like a scared business. Uh, and runs it assuming that competitors are eventually going to wise up and figure out how to compete with him. His incumbent advantage is his customer base, but he's no better than his last transaction. So if a new, you know, if, if Walmart were to create a better Amazon tomorrow, Amazon's customers would be in jeopardy of going to Walmart. But Okay, so 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 and so now let's let's take that example. Let's assume that's correct. Obviously, Amazon uh, has built itself a patent portfolio, as all major technology companies uh, do. Uh, either they're building it, or in the case of Facebook, deploying a tremendous amount of capital just in the last several months to uh, build up an intellectual uh, property uh, portfolio. Um, I guess when you look back now on Priceline. Uh, um, is there a sense that the reason it's achieved its exceptional market cap in and of itself, um, what, how much of that has to do with intellectual, with its, its licenses to patents or, or its patents themselves relative to its execution? Uh, I would say it's mostly execution. Uh, what the intellectual property allowed Priceline to do in its early days is not have competitors. So there are no competitors to Priceline's core product of naming your own price. Unless Walker Digital licensed it, which it chose well, not Well, Priceline to. owns its own, owns the key patents. Oh, you, okay. So, so they, that right. they own them. So, okay. so Microsoft copied Priceline's name your own price service for a brief time, and they offered it on Expedia, and we brought a suit against them, and they shut it down. So there is nobody who offers what Priceline offers. Now, that doesn't mean people can't compete with Priceline. Of course they can. They just have to compete some other way. They have to give value to the customer some other way. And there's a million ways to give value to customers. We don't own the idea of giving value to customers. We just own one way to collect demand. Hotels.com, hotel Hotel. You can go on Hotels.com and see right. where there are different retail prices. Sure. And you can sit. And some of them have even copied up to the point of the patent of having opaque pricing where you don't see the price, but you can't name it, but you don't see it. You know, they, they've come as close as they dare come to the intellectual property. So what IP does is it gives you the breathing room, much like a greenhouse. Right. It allows your seeds to grow. It allows people who, it, it allow, as long as you have enough money to, to counter sue people like Microsoft, it allows you to keep a space around your business solution mm -hmm. if you've really invented one. Now, if you're eBay, 
you can have a great business, but anybody can start an auction site. If you're, if you're, if you're Amazon, you can have a phenomenal business, but you have to worry any day that somebody else builds a series of warehouses and distribution centers, and basically you don't own the way you serve customers. You simply out-execute. Right. That being said, execution is where the extraordinary value is, happens, because rarely do ideas in and of themselves create the business value. Okay, so let's talk about that, because from this, as I understand your career, and you, and you, you, you know, make sure you, I'm sure you will correct me if I'm wrong, you went from being a, a you know, big time, big internet time. entrepreneur, e-commerce go-getter, Edison of the digital age, all these kinds of things. Oh, and yeah, then you, and then you, big time. you peeled <laughs> back, you were pretty, you, you, and then you, you, you yeah, end up wife. going you back to your to laboratory. This big time. You're, 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 <laughs> I, I think your wife thinks you're very big time. Big Jay. time, yeah, right. Don't worry, I, I, she Take called out the me. garbage, Mr. She, big time. She told, yeah. she told me you're very big time. Big time. Um, <laughs> the, you go back to Walker Digital, and you go back into your laboratory, as I understand it, if you will, mm -hmm. and you continue to, you return to the whiteboards and continue to largely spend time thinking about new business inventions, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that like how we think of like the last seven or eight, say, really 10 years, I guess, uh -huh. of your career? Yeah, now, I, didn't, I don't want to operate a public company. Uh, you know, I, yeah, can, talk about I can highly unrecommend it. Um, <laughs> You know, for those of you that think you do, change your mind now, save yourself the trouble. You know, running a public company is not a lot of fun. It's hard work, very hard work, uh, especially in the age of Sarbox. Uh, the regulations are beyond stifling. So uh, just for everyone, let's, Sarbanes-Oxley is legislation that came into the market. After the Enron uh, scandal, yeah. Congress yes. passed a set of enlightened laws to reduce business effectiveness by 50 to 80 percent. Um, and they gave it a name of the Sarbanes-Oxley, the two geniuses that came up with it. Um, common shorthand is Sarb-Ox. That sounds good. Uh, and people who run public companies will tell you that they spend about a third to half of their time doing worthless bullshit. Uh, to comply with laws that have no use. Um, and so it's just not a lot of fun. And if you're an entrepreneur, you know, it's a bit like saying, I like to build buildings, but I'm not interested in being the janitor in them. Yeah, that okay? was, a, that was so. in fairness, a pretty, uh, I, 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 there's no question that public company officials find Sarbanes-Oxley to be cumbersome. And a lot of entrepreneurs not, basically leave public companies yes. because they just don't want to put up with it. And it was true in my case as well as others. You know, you, you, life is short. Well, you you left you left long before there was Sarbanes Oxley. You no, long before. No, you, running you, a public company is not a lot of fun yeah. because you basically when you run a public company in the United States, it's all about quarterly earnings. You're managing the perception of the marketplace. You're, you're really spending a great deal of your time, especially if you're a young company, uh, but any company in dealing with the public when you're a public company, uh, dealing with the requirements of the SEC. There were there's just a lot of requirements. And there always were. So I, I uh, started Priceline, hired the management, took it public, uh, enjoyed it. They're a great team. And I went back to the lab because that's what I like doing. Right. And, and let's face it, you, prior to this, well, the, the, the piece of your career we didn't cover is you'd been running companies long before Priceline as well. So there had been a, a 20 years, I think, you'd been running in, companies really been since building companies college my, graduation. Building my comp companies my whole life. Yeah. So you're 20 years into this entrepreneurial career. You step back into the lab, and 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 how do you make decisions about what to do? What's happening in that lab? Who's in that lab? Uh, there are about 35, 40 of us, um, people who are who like solving problems, and we work on problems that I think are commercially valuable. So we've spent you know 20 years inventing solutions to problems that we think have a value. So we work on problems. We work on business problems. Uh, and we don't usually talk much about it because it doesn't help us to tell others what we're doing. We just work on them. So uh, we work on all kinds of interesting business problems in about 15 different industries. And we have developed oh, probably 800 to 1,000 <coughs> solutions over 20 years. Uh, and so you, do, you don't always get because that's not the size of your patent portfolio. That's about the size of the patent portfolio. Oh, that is the size. Excuse yeah, it's me. It's about eight hundred to a thousand. So you've probably developed more than those, but then thrown oh. them out or what? What well, are you? Most things we throw 20, out. Twenty thousand into it, or oh, God yeah, knows yeah, what. Yeah, yeah. You, well, we we have a lot of of, of useless uh, <laughs> results. So, but but like any lab, you do a lot of things. Uh, that's you know, 
they call it research because you don't know what you're doing. So let, let, let's, let, let's pick one. Let, let, let's pick one and, and talk about the gestation and the process you go through. All right, you know, and it, 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 it could be even a hypothetical one if you don't want to share anything. I assume, by the way, you're perfectly fine disclosing the ones you have the patents on. They're, they're a matter of public record. The patent is the most public of all documents. A Correct. patent is a teaching. So a patent is a bargain between the inventor and society where the inventor, uh, in return for disclosing uh, his or her complete operating details of how to build the invention, receives a limited period of exclusivity from the government uh, under very defined specification. That's what a patent is, a very defined specification of what you can for a limited period of time Actually, the law reads to preclude others from practicing. Right. So, so why don't? So, for example, last year you got into some litigation with some gaming companies. Let's just like explore that one. I, um, uh, I think some of the companies were Activision, MiniClip, you know, a variety of other online gaming companies. And Walker Digital, I think, in the year two thousand, got a patent for. Um, and I'm paraphrasing here, so, you know, the ability to share the results of a game with a central repository for the purposes of comparing those results with others, a kind of leaderboard-like construct. Is that a fair...? Yeah, I, I don't want to characterize, so I don't want to characterize any one patent because that's unfortunately legally admissible in court, so I can't okay. characterize a patent, but let's just take uh, okay, a I hypothetical. Let's just take a hypothetical. Yeah. So we worked in the video game area. Before the internet was popular, we, said, we sat down and said, what problems might the internet solve in the video game space? What right. problems might it solve? Right? If you had an online world and it had all kinds of capacities, what solutions might you provide that don't exist today right. All right, that you could teach others how to do? So for example, we might say, well, one solution might be to have tournaments for which people couldn't cheat by, by entering under multiple names. Because if you had an online tournament, you might have a problem saying, well, supposing somebody just entered under multiple names and then they pretended to play each other, but they were all just faking out the tournament to win prizes. So you could imagine a scenario under which online games Absolutely. would have a problem where tournament players might cheat by, by faking. So you might invent a solution to that. You might say, all right, our solution to that will be they have to have a cell phone so that when they call, when they play this online game, they have to call us from their cell phone because they won't be able to fake multiple cell phone numbers right. too hard. Right. Right. And so we'll use the fact that they have one cell phone to prove that they're not masquerading as five different people on our website. So that would be an example of an invention to solve a problem. Right. If we were the first to have invented that idea, we could then go to the patent office and say, hey, we have an idea, an invention of how to use cell phones to prevent people from masquerading in online tournaments as multiple players. And if you were the first to have had that idea and you could disclose it properly to the patent office and you could spend enough time and money in lawyers to write it up, the patent office, after an interminable length of time, typically three to seven years, would eventually come back and say, Nah, we don't agree. And then you'd fight with them for another two years, and then they'd come back and say, oh, wow, you really were first. And then they'd give you this piece of paper, which is all you have is the right to sue somebody. And then big companies would go and ignore your pieces of paper and say, we really don't care what you did, because we can just ignore you, because we're big companies. And then we're just going to go practice your invention. We'll see you in court. Good luck, sucker. OK, in which case, most people so say, what can we do? We're screwed. Okay. Right, right, right. Well, we so just that, be the exception to that so, rule. So, right. So, th so that, th right. So that's certainly a view of it. I mean, other people would claim. Other people would argue, and, and I think you know this. And I'm. I, I, I can really, give you both sides I, of the argument. I'm very interested in you getting a chance. Be, uh, you getting a chance to talk about your own perspective and even ideology about this, because I think the clear conventional wisdom in at least the tech industry. Uh, broadly speaking, is that the, this kind of patent filing is a tax on innovation, right? That's what it's frequently referred to by guys like Fred Wilson or Brad Feld or numerous early stage guys, but even more broadly up to Jeff Bezos has changed his tune on, on how he thinks patents should be enforced and a variety of other people. So explain, I certainly, you know, explain why you think that the invention of the patent, but not its commercialization, should 
should then, you know, should allow you to then down the road claim, as you said, you did something with AdWords. And I think last year, I don't know if this was, but I know that you did sue um, Google or, I'm gonna come back to the library stuff in a second. 